This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. Late night with Daryl Morris on Talk Radio. After 11 tonight, we're going to get into uh, a, a difficult but important conversation that we need to talk about uh, again after the uh, the tragic but not inevitable death of uh, Sabina Nessa this week. Uh, we, we'll talk in a minute about some of the, the, the media coverage or the lack thereof uh, in the days after she disappeared and was murdered and how it took an Instagram post, actually, wasn't it? I think I saw something on Instagram um, trying to promote her story on Thursday before it got the, the, the traction that... Um, that comes anywhere near close to what Sarah Everard got. We'll talk about that in more detail in a sec. We'll also speak to Rebecca Hitchin uh, from End Violence Against Women after 11 tonight on Talk Radio. Our Friday panel are standing by as well to get into some of the big stories of the week. Samantha Smith is a journalist and contributor at The Spectator. And Jess and Reed is the head of Young Voices UK and join you now. Jess and Samantha, hello, good evening. Hi. Good evening. Thank you for um, for being with us. I appreciate it. Um, should we start on that issue? As it seems to be, uh, it seems to be pretty fiery, doesn't it? Um, and 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 listen, I'm I'm I'm, I'm keen not to rehash uh, the Brexit conversation. I'm keen not to rehash the debates of 2016. But are we ignoring the Brexit effect in the shortage uh, of uh, in in the supply chain issues, Jason, and therefore undermining our efforts to try to fix it? Quite possibly we are ignoring or at least understating the Brexit effect, but it's very hard to say. Uh, a lot of it is driven by the pandemic, a lot of it is driven by various other factors. There's probably a lot of overlap between what's causing those two things. Um, simple short-term pragmatic solutions like, it, like you were talking about, uh, visas for European lorry drivers, irrespective of Brexit, even if you're the strongest Brexit supporter in the world, it would seem that that's a sensible thing to do. But I think we have a right to be ignoring the effects of Brexit, to be honest. We, uh, as a nation, finally have come to peace with the, the result of the referendum. It was amazing to see after the most recent cabinet reshuffle, there was practically no discussion at all of the number of Remainers and Leavers in the cabinet, which I think is the first time that's happened. There's, a, there's, a, there's a difference, though, isn't there, Jason? And 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 to a degree, I I agree. I don't think it's worth us rehashing the debates and the the arguments that we had in in 2016. But if you if you deliberately ignore where there are problems, then you 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 miss the opportunity to fix them, don't you? Or you negate your opportunity to fix them. Samantha, is that not the point here? That that in order to fix this problem, let's not have a fight. Let's find a fix. In order to fix this problem, we have to acknowledge the problem exists in the first place. You know, I agree with you that, you know, obviously Brexit was always going to have its short term impact. It was always going to have its pitfalls and its peaks. And we can't understate the fact that Brexit in the short term will have an impact on things like our supply chains, on global demand, on our, abil on our ability to, you know, secure parks, secure workers, secure labour in our country. But I think it's also very foolish of people to ignore the fact that this is a global problem. As um, Jason mentioned a moment ago, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> As Jason mentioned a moment ago, um, this is not an issue that is contained to the UK. It is an issue that we're seeing in Brazil, in Taiwan, in Australia. We're seeing, you know, the the effects of the, of the USA and the China trading wars playing out globally we're seeing a society that has become so prone to panic that the smallest indication is, do is samantha is dog hungry by any chance has, has, no, dog, has dog been caught up in the food About shortages 10 30 p.m every night he <laughs> goes through a phase of moaning and crying i think he reached that time in the evening <laughs> yeah, fair enough. listen samantha, apologies. listen samantha i take i take the point I, there's, a, there's an important point to be made here that, that a lot of these issues are global i think it's also a fair point to make that a lot of them are affecting us harder uh, because of the effects of brexit ricocheting through them as well i wonder if there's an issue right. though with uh, with particularly with this government i guess but also people i mean to a degree jane but then but then jane in manchester agreed that we should issue temporary visas to, to to eu nationals to fix this problem today tomorrow which is what businesses are crying out for us to do and that there is there is there is i guess a reluctance to do that perhaps on some people's parts because of the hangover from the brexit debate you know i would argue that we, we're always looking for skilled workers from EU countries, from abroad. So, you know, we want doctors from Pakistan. We, we do, want... but we also need low-skilled workers from the EU as well, don't we? Right now. We need them right now. So-called low-skilled. I, I like that as much as the next person. 
You know, I, I, I strongly believe that at the moment we're still seeing the shocks of the pandemic. We're seeing vaccine passports as a possibility still for some sectors of business and for international travel. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing the impact of the pandemic still playing out on the global stage. We don't know who can and cannot come in and out of this country, not just because of immigration laws, but because of health laws. And, you know, I'm a big anti-vaccine passport person. Uh, I personally believe that we should have free unrestricted travel as long as we're able to secure the proper documentation. But I agree that we do need an immediate, an immediate solution to our supply shortage. We need more drivers. We need more okay. um, supplies coming into the UK. But I think that many media outlets and certain sectors of, you know, Twitter and Facebook are catastrophizing the okay. shortages that we're seeing. You know, I've never personally seen a shortage in any supermarket that I've been to. I know mm. that uh, yeah, some of my family members are um, lorry yeah. drivers and things. There's plenty of no, I know, I know, I know. So I've never seen oxygen, but I, I, I know it exists, um, and and I suppose that's the problem, isn't it? Um, um, what's the dog called, by the way? I think we should give give the dog its proper name check. My dog is called Jelly, and he is a forty two kilogram American bulldog that's currently staring at me from across the room. <laughs> and is, is, this, is, this a, is this a radio debut for Jelly? It is a radio debut for Jelly, and he's making the most of it. He's getting all the airtime he can. Congrats clearly. to Jelly. He'll have to invoice us. Uh, I'm, sure we can, uh, <laughs> I'm sure we can sort something out. Um, okay, listen, uh, interesting uh, conversation, and interesting to see where our attitudes are to having the B word in that conversation. Uh, let's move on. Jason, I want to talk to you about the Labour Party conference just briefly. That kicks off tomorrow. Uh, Keir Starmer will be getting his head down tonight. We heard earlier from a former Labour advisor that, uh, that it's a big one for him, that it affected kind of his make or break. Uh, so far as she's concerned. Um, is that true? Is that really true? Or, I mean, Theresa May, post her conference, managed to, in some respects, uh, pull it back around. Are these things really as big and important and serious to the leader as they're often made out? It's easy to overstate, but um, conference is a, is a vessel where the leader can do what they want to do. They can play it down if they want to, or they can make a big thing of it. As Starmer is in a situation where he's obviously trying to use all the hype around conference to fight his internal party battles. We all know that the, the Labour Party loves nothing more than talking about the Labour Party. And that's exactly what we're seeing at the moment. He's got all these controversial reforms that he's trying to push through about the way that Labour leaders are elected. He knows that there's not a general election around the corner immediately. So I would expect in future conferences, we will see Keir Starmer pitching himself outwardly to the country as a future prime minister but at the moment he's not a future prime minister he's just labor leader and he's trying to deal with some of the pushback that he's getting from within his party from the unions and from the left and so a victory for him from this conference would be just toning down a little bit that pushback and having a little bit more unity a little bit more consensus behind his leadership okay um samantha's got off screen if you're watching on talkradio.tv you'll notice that samantha isn't on screen have we been getting samantha have we been getting rid of the dog have you been getting jelly out of the room is that what that's that's what happened I, uh, you know, I don't want any animal rights activists to come after me for this, but I did have to remove Jelly from the situation no, temporarily. I can't believe it, Samantha. I can't believe it. I what know, a scandal. I should be locked up for animal cruelty. This is the scandal. We've got a whole campaign starting. Uh, you trend on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, justice for Jelly. Justice for Jelly. Absolutely. You're on them all over again. Uh, absolutely. Uh, listen, uh, you're, you're on the other end of the political spectrum to Keir Starmer. Uh, listen, let's, let's imagine that he's listening right now. He's in his hotel room in Brighton. Uh, so Samantha, as somebody from the other end of the political spectrum, what would your advice be? He says, Samantha, what do I do? You know, I, I'm not sure I could offer advice to him. All I could say is, at the end of the day, you can't fight a losing battle. I think what we've seen from the time that Keir Starmer was elected is a Labour Party that does not want to see his leadership succeed. They aren't behind him. They have never supported him. He doesn't seem to be able to reclaim the, you know, the working class red wall um, Labour voters that he that have been true to Labour for decades. He can't appease the far left, the Zara Sultans of the world. He can't see, he can't seem to please any single sector of his party. And as far as it goes, I don't believe that despite his best efforts, despite all the 14,000 word essays he wants to write, mm. he cannot force a party to support him. And the only well, way that's, forward, that's happened think, before, though, hasn't it, Samantha? I mean, and... and um... 
I, I think Labour Party leaders uh, are always loathed to invoke Blair, but he will be looking at that period of history and recognising that actually they did achieve at least something that came close to unity, or at least Tony Blair managed to mute uh, those um, those divisions for a time. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that he's able to do that in the time before 2024, is it? I think looking you know, from the outside, on the outside looking in, the Labour Party seems to be so intent on destroying itself, on infighting and on, you know, picking apart their own policies and their own party direction, that it's very, very difficult for any modern day leader to unify this sort of cabal. Well, they said, uh, I know they the said that in the 90s, though, didn't they? Sure, staring but, at the current state of the party. Sure, but, but they said that in the 90s, they didn't, this month, and, and it, it, it happened. So what, what's the, I mean, are we, are we saying conclusively that it cannot happen again? I'm not saying conclusively, but I'm saying that I don't think that Keir Starmer is the right person for that job. I think that Keir Starmer is an excellent pol- is an excellent politician as far as it goes. He's very accomplished. He's very, you know, I love a moderate. I'm a moderate myself. He's a very upstanding, high octane, very n- normal and nice guy. But I don't think that he has the sort of leadership and vision that Labour needs at the moment to become a functioning opposition once again. Because as a Conservative, I... I still believe that a strong opposition makes for a stronger government overall. And it would make elections a hell of a lot more interesting mm-hmm. if we had a party that could fight back. Okay. But um, Labour in no, are in no position to do so at the moment. Sure. Okay. We, we, we've got to move on. Uh, it's an interesting point. Um, uh, Calvin Robinson has, has tweeted, uh, by the way, uh, with hashtag justice for jelly. Uh, <laughs> so that's already begun. Just uh, just a, a style point, by the way, uh, as Calvin has set us off, it's hashtag justice for the number four uh, <laughs> jelly. Okay. Just... Uh, from a, just a, 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 a. I can't believe this is what is going to be taken away from this debate. <laughs> of all the things, of all the things. Uh, thank you, Calvin. Uh, listen, on a, on a more serious point, uh, we need to get into another one of the big stories uh, this week that involved, of course, another tragic death of a woman, uh, Sabina Nessa. Uh, a vigil was held in the last couple of hours in uh, Kidbrook, where she was found on Saturday afternoon. Um, uh, Samantha, I want to start with you on this for obvious reasons, and I, I, I'm keen to get the perspective from you, not so much on the issue of of, of the women's safety bit. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk in more detail. We'll give that the, the time and the space that it uh, it deserves after eleven tonight. But on on the reaction bit, one thing that really struck me and has struck a lot of people and has been a part of this conversation, understandably, this week is the fact that it took until Thursday, even Friday morning, really, for a lot of people to catch on to this story. It hadn't in any way had the same kind of coverage that Sarah Everard had, um, particularly in the days and the hours after her disappearance and her death. Why did it take an Instagram campaign for this particular story to find its way up the news agenda, do you think? I think that, you know, one of the first things that struck me as well, just like you, was the fact that I was seeing Sabina's case on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, but I wasn't seeing it anywhere in any mainstream news platforms. And I think that... It, raising, it raises a really interesting question of what exactly is newsworthy to the mainstream media nowadays? What is it about a woman's murder that defines whether it can make the front pages or not? I mean, even with the um, with the front pages, tomorrow's front pages that we were seeing flashing up during the adverts, we see, you know, big bold letters talking about su- about supply chain shortages, and then a small byline about Sabina in the top right corner. It's interesting that since her death, 52 women have been killed in a case where a man has been the suspect. We hear about barely any of these. So is that 50, that's, Sarah, that's, that's 52 Sarah since Sarah Everard, Everard, right? Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. Um, since Sarah Everard's death. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the fact that, you know, even Sarah's case faded into the back burner for the mainstream media until another woman was killed, it suggests that the way that the media is reporting on the deaths of these women, these individuals who had hopes, dreams, lives, family, friends who have a right to be heard and whose story should be told, it's it's almost as though they're being treated as just another another case in a long line of tragedies and mm. the way in which the media is reporting on these stories absolutely should be altered. Yeah. D- Jason, do we have an issue with this sort of ricocheting through that ho- the whole of that process? We hear time and time again about women reporting issues not being taken seriously enough, about women still not feeling safe even though certain measures are taken and that, that actually we are we're a step behind on this issue. We've been a step behind on this issue for a while and we still are. Yeah, sadly this kind of story, as Samantha says, isn't all that uncommon. There are countless other 
cases which have got nowhere near as much attention as either Sarah Everard or Sabine Anessa. Um, and it's also true that a lot of this is just organic. It's just the way that the media works and popular discourse works. If you have a statistic that says, here's the number of women who were killed by men last year, for example, that's a lot less uh, emotionally compelling than here's a picture of Sabina smiling. And then here's the story of how she died. Um, it's hard to say why different cases pop up the way they do. You know, the, the George Floyd's death um, achieved, uh, had a huge amount of uh, anger and protest as a result of it. But there, were, there are countless other po- cases, especially in the US, mm. of um, black people being the victim of pre- police brutality and often dying. And they're often cases that we don't hear about. So it's just when something comes along at the right time, I think. Mm. But it's if you try to take into account all of the cases it's like trying to understand how big the universe is it's just so unbelievably tragic that we can't wrap our heads around it mm, okay it's a really interesting point though, isn't it what what is it that that causes that swell of of um of reaction i suppose around a, a story like sarah Everard and george floyd and, and not some of the others listen we're gonna leave it there we're out of time i'm afraid but really nice to talk to you jason reed who is the head of young voices uk thank you so much